Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Negro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, how you doing, everybody? It is Monday, August 6th, 2018. Time for another show. Maybe you are uh, just arrived back, if you were lucky, from New Orleans, where they held the Netroots Nation 2018 convention, conference. What are we calling it these days? I don't know. Uh, understand that the announcement was made, as it usually is, during the big, oh, is it the Saturday night wind-up, basically, of, uh, of the conference, where they announce where next year's conference is taking place. And I understand it's Philadelphia, so East Coasters, uh, let's say fewer excuses to not go. Let's say there's no excuse, but, uh... Well, we, you have a year to find an excuse, I guess, is the situation. Sounds like another great one, and uh, unfortunately, we we missed again. It's been so long since we've been there, but uh, I'm sure great experience for those of you who are returning year after year. Great experience for anybody who might have made it for the first time. That's part of the reason that the conference moves around the country. So if you've been, I don't know, let's say um, chained to a tree in Philadelphia, well, you're lucky you found a tree. And secondly, you uh, either don't have far to go once you escape or, you know, you could get incredibly lucky and it could be the tree next to the convention center where we hold the next conference. So make your plans, pack your bags, schedule things around whatever you're doing next year. I have no idea how anybody plans these things. I can't think a year in advance. I, I don't even know. We don't even know what we're doing on this show, and the show has already begun. So you know how it is. Uh, all right. Well, let's see. All right. Uh, kids are back home from camp, as you might be able to tell. One of them uh, blowing his nose furiously in the background. Thank you for thinking of us. He's probably got earbuds in and doesn't hear any of it. So uh, we'll work on that. Other production issues going on in the background. Once Greg joins us, we'll <laughs> mute the microphones and go yell at everybody. But kids are back, had a good time, you know, scout camp, everything's very scouty. We're working on all kinds of crazy stuff. Oldest boy working on his Eagle Scout project, which we have to, well, we were hoping to try and get done before he returned to school, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen. It's a busy day, a busy week, busy month, part of a busy year here at uh, KGRO in the Morning World Headquarters. So many other things happening. Our president's a traitor. That's going to be a problem. Uh, he's a thief and he's stealing everything that isn't nailed down. That's going to be a problem. Even if we get rid of him, we'll be out of money because he stole it all. And our standing in the world forever diminished. And, you know, it's uh, it's going to be a long road back. Anyway, we'll round up all those stories and more for you very shortly. I have seen the numbers climbing in the little blue bubble next to Greg's name in my Skype window here. 25. 25 entries in this morning's roundup. Uh, not all of them separate news stories. Usually, uh, well, very often you'll you'll send one news story and one will pop up and then he'll send a comment. Oh my God, we're doomed. I can't believe it. <laughs> Whatever the comment is. Or you know, the polling shows this isn't going to happen. That's two or possibly three. But uh, not at all, uh, well, not beyond the realm of possibility. There are 25 separate items that demand your attention this morning. And we'll see how many of them we get to when uh, we when we have Greg join us. Let's see other things. I, I haven't I haven't been able to spend a great deal of time on Twitter this morning or over the weekend gathering up uh, the hot items. So uh, well, perhaps we'll leave that for for Greg. And uh, I know very often some of the things that I round up and tuck away in pocket end up in his roundup and saves me trouble. And, uh, and that's why we have him on. It's a, it's a pleasure to have him here and have him save us trouble. It's a twofer, really, if you think about it that way. Good morning, Greg. How you doing? Good morning. All right. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Do you know we'll see anything you Wednesday, today? and uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about. I will probably because we're skipping everything today. So, all right. So there's two enormous stories. Okay. Which one do you want to do? Uh, the, the primaries enormous. tomorrow, or Donald mm. Trump and his multitude of lying exposed oh, by out. the mole within the Trump campaign, who turns out to be Donald Trump. Oh, 
That seems like a, such an old story. Uh, yeah. Let's go to the uh, well. Let's do the, the the important one that involves other people. Okay, and, let's uh, do other their people. lives. All right. So it turns out QAnon might have been, in <laughs> fact, a uh, liberal hoax all along. Oh, liberal hoax. Yeah, and it uh, turns out uh, hmm. a lot of the MAGA people this morning, yeah, are thoroughly rejecting it. Uh, you mean uh, rejecting QAnon? The idea. Oh, Quinta uh, Juricic uh, uh, from Lawfare huh. retweets Michael Flynn Jr. this morning. Michael Flynn Jr. was all into Pizzagate. And Pizzagate well, was part of the pedophile ring that Trump was trying to break up, and that is the heart of the QAnon conspiracy. Right. And I am not uh, sure where we're going to get our next pedophile ring. It's very difficult. Sure. So Quinta uh, uh, retweets Michael Flynn. Quinta says, the sudden MAGA recoil against QAnon is a thing to behold. Awesome. Michael Flynn Jr., he of Pizzagate support, says, folks, let me be clear. I have zero association with the whole Q conspiracy. Hmm. Well, I've been mentioned alongside the QAnon hashtag before. I've never taken it seriously, and you shouldn't either. Hashtag Monday well, morning. Uh, okay, that is a big story. I was, I know a lot of people were wondering over the weekend, what would it take to get rid of QAnon? And people started the rumor saying, that it was started by liberals. Yeah, right. Uh, I, somebody all said, sudden, oh, no, well, it's all drying up. Yeah. Well, good. All right. That was. Uh, that was more or less what people were suggesting, and I wondered, how could we do of that? Of course, uh, as some people are saying, obviously, they got to Mike Flynn Jr., yeah, well, so that sure, gives you an idea of how deep it. this thing goes. Well, deep state, yeah, this could be a whole deep country going on here behind this deep state. I, do you want to go deep on this story? Because uh, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. I mean, okay. that's not the primaries, but that's okay. <clears> now you from, got me. Uh, BuzzFeed News. It's looking extremely likely that QAnon is a leftist prank on Trump supporters. <laughs> what the heck is wrong with boomers? Yeah, so uh, the younger <laughs> alt-right uh, people say that the older alt-right people are responsible for getting sucked into QAnon. That's because boomers are right. dumb. Uh, well, okay. I, I don't uh, know I'm about just the saying, reason. this is the whole subtext about the fight that's going on okay. right now. There's a growing wow. group of Trump supporters who are convinced that Donald Trump is secretly trying to save the world from a global pedophilia ring. And as complicated as the QAnon conspiracy is, that's basically at the heart of it. Yeah, all right. Okay. The QAnon conspiracy theory, uh, theory is vague, complicated, nonsensical, and has been building support online since October 2017, starting with a post on 4chan's politically incorrect message board called Breadcrumbs. Q clearance right. patriot. Military intelligence. What is state secrets and how upheld in the Supreme Court? What must be completed to engage MI over other three-letter agencies? What must occur to allow for civilian trials? Why is this relevant? What was Flynn's background? Why is this relevant? Why did Admiral R. NSA meet Trump privately without authorization? Uh. The author of Breadcrumbs claimed he was a member of the federal government with Q clearance. It, it's not yes. Q from Star Trek. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Uh, right, right, Jean-Luc Picard something. will clear that up because it's going to be a Star Trek reboot with him as captain. <laughs> <But> that's <laughs> yes. the story for another day. The post was screenshot. Mm -hmm. And posted to Reddit's conspiracy thub subreddit, and voila, QAnon was born. And summing up exactly what QAnon is hard to do and a waste of time, but the crux of it is that Trump is secretly fighting a global cabal of pedophiles, led, of course, by Obama and Clinton, and eventually they'll wind up in Gitmo because of it. Mm. I, I threw that last part in, but that's true in, in terms of uh, looking at what the conspiracy theorists think. Uh -huh. According to Q... Nearly every president before Trump was a criminal president, yada, yada, and Satanist and all this stuff. And that's not really the point. <clears throat> the point is, uh, as QAnon gained more media attention, many users on 4chan began to suspect it was probably all BS, actually pretty lame, and also quite possibly a giant prank. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that would be great. I think. It would, actually. I think. Um, and so they tell. decided that uh, QAnon supporters are on the whole usually a bit older than your typical far-right internet troll. Yeah. By the way, later on, I have an article on the Pundit Roundup today about one of those trolls who apologized <clears throat> mm. and is, about, is uh, recommending everybody vote for Democrats. But we'll get to that. To get an idea of what kind of people believe QAnon conspiracy, well, Roseanne Barr. <laughs> Younger far-right internet personalities have been divided when it comes to QAnon stuff. Jack Basoviec huh. uh, announced on Saturday he'd be debunking it 
in an interview with somebody who started it. Oh, I think I did see a hint about that, too. I just didn't, you know, take I, right. I, I didn't know who to take seriously. None of exactly. them. Working okay. on a new O-A-N-N -N piece. O-A-N-N. -N. Debunking mm. QAnon. O-A-N-Q, I get it. Yeah, there's a bunch of letters in the alphabet, and sometimes Hi. they, they run right. out, so they repeat them. I am in contact with one of the people who started it who is ready to go on record. Uh. Now, one of the tricky things about QAnon is it's almost impossible to nail down who exactly started it and who's writing it now. Yeah. That's... But it does appear that at least for 4chan trolls, the narrative about QAnon is shifting. Many now believe it was meant to be a prank on older conservatives all along. Now, this, of course, makes just as little sense as anything else. It started on 4chan, which isn't exactly popular with older conservatives, and almost nothing about it has been distributed in a way that would suggest it was meant to be discovered by older Internet users. Hmm. Like, you know, you got mail. Right. For instance, it didn't start on Facebook. Uh -huh. yeah, that's it. it wasn't forwarded by email. That's how older <laughs> that's people true. get their, their information. Yeah, you got to have a lot of forward, forward, change, forward, right? forward, forward, forward in front of it. Now, means truth. while it's almost impossible to prove who started it, there's some proof it was meant to be a prank all along. And more importantly, it's looking more and more likely that QAnon is actually a prank by leftists and anarchists to make the far right look deranged. Um, okay. okay. Pretty good so far, then. The Wu Ming Foundation, which is a group of leftist anarchists, Wu Ming means no name, I'm told, <laughs> uh, okay. actually related to a book. Roberto Bui, Giovanni Catabriga, Federico Guglielmi, and Luca De Meo, writing under the name Luther Blissett, published an Italian novel called Q in 1999. Uh, and it's kind of a medieval thriller. But <laughs> Luther Blissett was a name regularly used in the 1990s by leftist anarchists and general troublemakers. It was used for staging all kinds of pranks. The Luther Blissetts in different cities. Think of Luther Blissett as one of those Guy Fawkes masks, only... In real life. I see. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there are parallels and other weird pranks online right? out there. Okay. Three of the authors behind Luther Blissett told BuzzFeed News that Luther Blissett Project was a network of activists, artists, and cultural agitators who all shared the name Luther Blissett, and they now operate under the name Wu Ming or No Name. Maybe. And the plot of their novel Q is pretty similar in structure to the basics of the QAnon conspiracy. It follows the journey of an unnamed Anabaptist religious radical across Europe during the 16th century, joining various movements that happened to be following the Protestant Reformation, and the whole time he's being pursued by a spy for the Roman Catholic Church named Q. Okay. The book sparked all sorts of debate about what it's about, but the author said it was meant to be autobiographical and described it as a playbook, as operations manual for cultural disruption. I... Basically, the, the novel, Q... Is a handbook for activists who want to disrupt society. Uh, all right. right tongue-in-cheek book. And the uh, Q conspiracy, QAnon, was meant to be tongue-in-cheek. Coincidences are hard to ignore, said three of the authors. Dispatches signed Q allegedly coming from some dark meanders of top state power, exactly like in our book. And they also pointed to the fact that the Q from QAnon is described almost exactly like Luther Blissett used to be described, an entity of about 10 people that have high security clearance. Okay. Wow. Right? So, ironically, it seems even QAnon followers have noticed the similarities. A user last month suggested the book calling it an old Q. An old Q. Hmm. Yeah, as for who could be carrying on their work in the 4chan age, the authors are fairly certain the main readers of Q in the U.S. are leftist and anarchist activists. Okay. So, while hmm. they're convinced QAnon started as a prank, they warn that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Let's take it for granted, they say, that QAnon started as a prank in order to trigger right-wing weirdos and have a laugh at them, and it's long become something very different. Hmm. At certain levels, it still sounds like a prank, but who's pulling it on whom? They don't know. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, they're, the they're pointing out that there's uh, questions about the whole Q thing, believe it or not. What? And... It's interesting because now the right wing uh, uh, stellars, the, the, the celebrities on social media are starting to distance themselves from it. And it's just really interesting to watch them backpedal and say, well, I never had anything to do with it. I never mm. believed this. That isn't uh, will be very interesting to watch. Uh, and I think that journalists are going to have to go to their 
diners and bars to ask them whether they still support Q. Exactly. And find out in a couple of weeks. But, well, that's really interesting. And I guess it was sort of what I hoped would either be revealed or someone would simply assert and then have it catch fire in order to get people off of this crap. They would. Right. You know, well, this, this looks like the beginning of the end of it, really. Well, that would be great. It's uh, it's taken too long and it's become dangerous. And there are at least two incidents that I know of and probably five that I haven't heard about yet, but everyone else knows about. Where people are, you know, they're showing up with guns to enforce the, you know, the Q prophecies, and uh, those people are crazy. And it, it, it's it's funny in the abstract to think about having manipulated everybody, uh, but you know how it goes. It's all fun and games till someone gets an eye out, and the eyes are coming out at this point. Mm. So, all right. That's so. A, there's that's that big story, I was not and the other that. big story that doesn't uh, only do, just like you and I only indirectly uh, involves Donald Trump yes. are the primaries tomorrow. Yeah, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on, and well worth uh, talking about. And let's start with Ohio 12. Which I think is Donald Trump tomorrow. believes the Q things, by the way, which is amazing because he's. You would think he'd know, like, okay, I'm I'm the president. This is or isn't true. But I think he's well, reading he right along with the, everybody else. Rallies, right? What's going on in my administration? He believes in the deep state thing. And I think he was looking to them to tell them what was really going on in his own administration. You know, it's the same people who collect guns because of the coming race war. So he's not exactly going to tell them not to. Right. There is voters. There is, you know, core group. Yeah. It says so right in the diners. They'll tell you. So, uh, All right. playbook. Let's yeah. Go. The Sorry. story that matters the most this week. Oh, all right. Good. I'm not sure that's right. But we'll make that the second. Next lead, is in Columbus, Ohio, where Republican Troy Balderson will face off against Come Democrat on. Danny O'Connor for a solidly red House seat. The race will give us a good sense of the landscape at the moment. It's a Republican district. The GOP has held for 35 years and Cook rates it as R plus seven. That's tomorrow, by the way. So a Democratic win or anything close would indicate that the D's have a massive advantage going into November. All right. I, I would like that. You'd like that? Uh, well, I'll tell you something else you'd like. Okay. Uh, let's just see if I can put my finger on it Troy here. Troy Balderson. What a joke uh, he's become. Yeah, well, you know, he's he's not exactly embracing Trump. Okay. And uh, not exactly running away from Trump. So it's really kind of a interesting mix of how he's trying to run. He's not going... Uh, uh, full in uh, Corey Stewart, the way that uh, that uh, Ed Gillespie did when he was running in Virginia. Okay, right, but uh, he still, uh, you know, uh, got a difficult situation here. Uh, Alex Eisenstadt, uh, also for political, is writing uh, Democrats surging on the eye of political uh, pivotal special election. The entire Republican Party machinery has converged on the suburban Columbus district for a furious 11th hour campaign aimed at saving a conservative House seat and averting another special election disaster. But in the final days ahead of Tuesday's election, signs were everywhere, and they don't mean yard signs, that Democrats are surging from recent polling to the private and public statements of many Republicans, including the GOP candidate himself. The district's been reliably red for more than three decades, but the sheer size of the Republican cavalry made clear how worried the party is about losing it. Ah, losing it. Well, they are losing it. I don't know how this district and will go. if Danny O'Connor does pull this off tomorrow, it would yeah. be a Connor Lamb type upset, and it will be due to independents who uh, are breaking his way. Yeah, or you have to have Connor in your name. I don't know whether, uh, which is the more scientific measure. Yeah, but, I suppose. Uh, that so, would be two uh, for two. Saturday so. evening, Trump went down there trying to juice up uh, his base. Uh, the problem is... <laughs> They like him, but they don't necessarily like anybody around him. Ah, okay. And they're quite worried about this election. So, uh, you know, if, if Balderson wins by two points, that's still a disaster. And if uh, he loses by two points, it's a mega disaster. So tomorrow's oh. going to be interesting, and All that's right. one of the reasons why it's one of the bigger stories. Go mega disaster. There was also, I think he went into Ohio having uh, decided to have a Twitter war with LeBron James, which I don't think bothered the crowd. Yeah, that's really but, smart. Yeah. Still, uh, other people who were probably not at the rally 
took note of things like that. At the rally, well, they were probably happy. They were fighting. There's a political LeBron. strategy, and then there's Trump's not being able to deal with any uh, black man who happens to be smart, intelligent, and powerful and doing well. Yeah. Or even if you were legitimately dumb but didn't like Trump, he would fight with you. But it, it's the other case. LeBron doing great things and saying, yeah, Donald Trump is a, is a jerk. I don't want anything to do with him. Oh, right. Wow. Next up uh, That's for tomorrow. Very smart. He's he's right on the he's on the ball. Uh, which he's is on not the ball. A Next up for tomorrow is a is a, a Trump clone, Chris Kobach, yeah. who's uh, running in the primary election uh, for uh, yes. governor. Yes, right, governor. And yeah, boy, he's had a, a a terrible week or so of press. Yeah, therefore he might do well. <laughs> right. It's he's, a Republican primary yeah, after all. He's leading the straw poll. Okay. Yeah. Right. A crucial moment will come in Tuesday's primary election, says the New York Times, when Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, a Trump ally who's become a national lightning rod for his views on immigration and voting rights, Is could snatch the nomination for governor from the incumbent Jeff Collier. Oh, if Republicans select that. a candidate as polarizing as Mr. Kobach, it could have profound political implications about the local national Democrats. Not only could they take back a Great Plains state governorship, winning veto power in the next round of redistricting, but they could also pick up a pair of House seats making Kansas as pivotal to the battle for control of the House as more traditional and more liberal battleground states. Hmm. So basically, a Corey Stewart-type person running at the top of the ticket isn't really good for you in November. Yes. But, you know, it's primary season, so nobody will pay attention to that. So that's another reason why that's important. Huh. And one last thing, it's not always about Republicans. The Democrat who is in trouble that people should be paying more attention to, of course, is Bob Menendez in New Jersey, hmm. as corrupt as they come. But he's a Democrat, and so he figured he'd win, maybe. But that's going to sure be a very close race. Win. Okay. He could uh, lose that. It well, would be really interesting if uh, the uh, Senate winds up 51-49 Republican because Bob Menendez lost. That would be bad. Uh, yeah, it would be. But uh, it's it would possible. Be bad no a lot matter of things are possible. Happens. There's a lot of moving parts this yeah. uh, fall. Hmm. But he's just like not a good person. So yeah, uh, well, that's a that is problematic. New Jersey and Republicans well in said. the Senate. So it's problematic. Really a, that's exactly right. Yeah, Republicans winning the Senate from New Jersey is not a frequent issue, though it is frequently threatened. Yeah, I mean, he could eke out a win as they always do in New Jersey, and uh, in Florida, Bill Nelson may eke out a win, but those two could also lose. It's yes. That close. Uh, all right. Well. Um, it's a thing. It's a thing. All right. So those are the uh, other uh, big stories. So between QAnon and the uh, primaries tomorrow, big thing. And of course, the major big thing story is Donald Trump uh, uh, completely ruining the lives of all of his uh, lawyers by tweeting over the weekend, fake news reporting a complete fabrication that I am concerned about the meeting of my wonderful son, Donald, had in Trump Tower. This was a meeting to get information on an opponent, totally legal, and done all the time in politics, and it went nowhere. I didn't know about it. So basically, <laughs> Donald Sr. throws Donald Jr. under the bus I... and says, I had nothing to do with it. It was all my wonderful son. I knew nothing. Right. A and, uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, well, yes. Uh, and, of course, the, the whole I, – I, I don't know if he realizes what he's doing, of course – um, when he says, you know, well, he essentially says, okay, so it was all, uh, I said it was, it had nothing to do with the collusion, it, but it actually does, but I didn't go. Right. So the collusion was my son, but he, it was a mistake or something. Oh, I, he didn't, well, it was accidental. Well, let me give you a, let me give you a Twitter sample of how this went over. <laughs> okay. okay. Molly Jongfast, novelist, daughter of Erica Young. Oh. Uh, he was just a coffee boy, a low level volunteer, a friend of a friend, Gary Busey's <laughs> son. He's actually Hillary Clinton's son. <laughs> and Josh Marshall wrote, Don Jr., a good guy, briefly my son. <laughs> right. For a very short time. For a very short time. So, you know, basically, he uh, completely destroyed his own defense. <laughs> and and not <laughs> the huge story of Ohio 12, but this is actually what everybody's talking about this morning. He's like a really smart brain, you know? Yeah, that, that was a really helpful tweet, Donald. That was good. Um, I also noted for uh, for for the record, as many people observed, that uh, Hope Hicks hitched a ride on Air Force One to the back and forth to the Ohio rally, 
she having been out of the White House for some months now, and uh, that basically after her ride on the plane, about during which time she talked about no one knows what with Trump and his lawyers, the story to which she would be a key witness of what happened at the meeting and who knew what and who drew up what in the statement issued allegedly by Donald Trump Jr. explaining the whole thing once the story broke, uh, she can testify to how that went. And then, and then the story became, well, okay, there was collusion, but it wasn't me personally after she got off the plane, which is a little interesting too. She must have so uh, there's this thing that uh, Center for American Progress puts together called the Moscow Project. Yes, I see this. And uh, it, it tracks things. It's become more relevant today. Uh, for example, they have below is a comprehensive chronological list of the contacts that have been discovered to date and the lies Trump's campaign transition in the White House told to hide them. The Trump campaign issued at least 15 blanket denials of contacts with Russia, all of which have been proven false. Yeah. I never met the Russians. Okay, I did, but it was about adoption. Well, it wasn't really about adoption. It was about getting dirt on Clinton, but that's okay. Everybody does that. And besides, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. That's, that's basically the defense. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, someone circulating the clips of Donald Trump Jr. railing to Jake Tapper about how the whole story is so fake, so phony at the time. Uh, yeah, right. more of the same. Okay. I like the evolution, though. It's been fun. That is pretty good. Uh, here's one, <clears throat> which we have just a little bit of time for before the break, or maybe we'll do it after the break, and I'll just tell you about it. Okay. It's called, I was a Trump troll in 2016, and I owe Hillary Clinton an apology. Well, that is and true. And it's a story of a Trump troll who was converted because he had a lovely sit-down with Sarah Silverman. Oh. Who convinced them liberals are actually smart, and he was wrong. Oh, well, that was good work. She's very good at that. Just, It's a very slow process to do that for everyone in America. One on one, exactly. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear more about that one. And uh, let's say, how about two minutes? Okay. All right. It's a date. I'll stick around. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Get Going in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Much to catch up with. Uh, yeah, all right. So we left uh, for a short break after teasing the story of, uh, I've opened it up here, David Weissman writing on his own behalf here in uh, Forward. Oh, okay. Interesting. And uh, saying, uh, I was a Trump troll in 2016 and I owe Hillary Clinton an apology. That's obvious enough and clear enough. But uh, I guess he's actually making that. Apology. He's doing it. So, yeah, so does that he mean said. he doesn't owe it or he owes more than one? I don't know. I hope he keeps going. It's a very large debt, David. Dear Secretary Hillary Clinton, in the 2016 election, I voted for Donald Trump. I didn't believe your warning about the Trump Russia connection. I was wrong. I would like to apologize to you, he tweeted. Wish I had listened to your warnings about Russia before I voted for Trump. You were right. Yes. Well. And then he talks about uh, why he was wrong. Uh, but here's the important part. To make amends for my country and my fellow Americans, I will thoroughly research candidates and I will no longer believe conservative clickbait articles, including Fox News. Many of these media organizations have spread lies about what liberals believe in and what they fight for. When I found the truth, I accepted liberal values. Well, I'll believe that when I see it. But here's the important line. I will be encouraging voters to vote blue this election and in 2020. And if you decide to run, you'll have my support. Oh, really? I don't think she's going to be running again. But if you want to encourage people to vote democrat that's fine yes and i think that as an ex maga supporter uh i think your voice would probably be heard more in our community than ours who i think have already been rejected out of hand mm -hmm. i can't tell you how many times i've been on twitter and somebody said oh you're from daily coast i don't have to listen to you ah yes right 
And uh, so my thought was, oh, well, we have a mute button. I really don't have to listen to you. But, you know, it's uh, you can have an engaged recent argument with people who think that way. You can with others. And if this is the ambassador that brings that message back, you know, there's Max Boot, there's uh, Steve Schmidt. These are people who have flat out said, I may be independent now. I am no longer a Republican and you all need to vote Democratic in November or if you're in Ohio 12 tomorrow. Yeah. And that's fine. That's a great message. Let them do that. Uh, I People on Daily Coast are not happy with these folks who figured they – you know, got screwed in 2016 and aren't just completely ready to forgive and forget. But I say it's not a question of forgive and forget. It's forgive and remember and okay. uh, just say thank you and move on. You, you don't need to, you know, uh, uh, indulge them. If this guy claims to have adopted liberal values, fine, prove it. But, you know, point is just vote. I'll take your vote. Uh, yeah. And I, I mean, I guess there's certainly a, a certain value to if he says he's going to go and do this work i mean i guess you don't have to believe him but there's nothing well, he's written it so you can read what him. he wrote and even if he does nothing else people will yeah. read it i i hope so and he was smart to say he's also going to be doing it in 2020 because uh, another solution would be let him help us change the vote in 2018 and then throw him off a cliff but uh if he if he also does it in 2020 that would be helpful too and also you'll never find him you don't know where he, he says he lives in <laughs> queens but don't go looking for him uh, that's and and you won't find him. He's in deep cover. You find me, the David Weissman in Queens. <laughs> You're a better detective than I am. Oh but, yeah. You know. Uh, I mean, there's I only one David mean. Weissman in all of New York right. City, right? We don't want to. I mean, I, I understand the instinct not to trust him or whatever. But I mean, what are you gonna what are you gonna do? He's just an anonymous guy. I won't. If you want to engage him and talk about it. He may satisfy you, he may not, but I suppose all the time that he spends arguing with you, he's not talking to other MAGA idiots about changing their minds. Exactly. And he Sometimes might you not just have, been have anyway, to bite your tongue and move on. Maybe. Uh, just, yeah, he could be lying. And, and when was the last time you got a guy who was lying on the internet to go, you know what? You're right. I, yeah. In, in the argument online, I give up. You're right. I'm wrong. I haven't, uh, I haven't reformed. I, I've never seen anybody agree to that before. So don't drive yourself crazy trying to argue with this guy if you run into him. I don't know why you would, but if you do, leave Queens. I right. Guess. Well, again, you know, the point is you don't have to go chase them. I got you. But if they come to you, say thank you and move on. And that's the end of it. Yeah. So speaking of lying, of course, Trump is doing a whole lot more lying at his rally in uh, Ohio. Forget about the fact that he picked on LeBron James, which was really dumb. Uh, so but uh, mm. Daryl Rowland, who is Columbus Dispatch public affairs editor, uh, tweeted this. Mm-hmm. Folks, as a neutral journalist, I'm seldom this blunt, but Donald Trump just outright lied to the people of central Ohio. Says news media made up the fact that he said he supported Steve Stivers. It was Trump himself who tweeted to vote for Stivers. Sorry, but that's the truth. I think he recommended voting for Stivers incorrectly in a um, – uh, primary where it wasn't really an issue, but that's okay. Okay. He also lied about bringing car plants to Ohio. He lied about the number of steel yes. plants opening up yes. in uh, the U.S. There's six new ones, I think he said, or eight or 14. I don't know. I guess it'll grow in the telling because that's the way Trump does stuff. He's a right. fabulous. But, uh, you know, he pretty much lies about everything. He lied about the Russia connections. He lied about North Korea who, by the way, not only have not denuclearized, but they're actually working on new missiles. He lied about Iran. He lied about – it's hard to find something he didn't lie about. Um, yeah, I don't think it can be done, not convincingly. That's uh, – okay, well, uh, I, I was a little worried when he started off as a neutral journalist, but uh, okay, fine, whatever. I, you got to the right conclusion. Right, and so why does all of this matter? Well – uh, Mike DeBonis writing for Power Post in the Washington Post really puts his finger on it. Trump's worst political nightmare, Democrats with subpoena power. There is really no reason to talk about impeachment. People are not interested in impeachment. If you look at polling on this and uh, civics follows this closely, don't impeach actually is slightly higher than impeach. And it's grown recently in the next in the last few weeks as Trump looks more guilty. People are not rushing to impeach. His base is, of course, rushing to support him. But that's not the play. The play is investigate and then let the facts take you where they will. You know, if we 
are right and he is guilty of everything we said he was and more, uh, impeachment may follow naturally. We'll see. But you don't go in there, uh, you know, already making up your mind about what you want to do. Do the work. Uh, okay. I've always been confused by this fight because when people say, well, I am not for impeachment. I'm for investigating and let the facts take you where they will. I'm like, okay. Right. But also I known as a where, political winner. <laughs> where we're going is impeachment. When we get there, I you better, better not find something. you but saying see, that I'm makes not you for sound it. like you're reasoned and reasonable. And that wins votes. That's a position that voters can accept. I guess so. Go uh, ahead saying flat and impeach him now is a political loser. Oh, well. It's... And so if you want to actually get stuff done, you got to be in power. In order to do that, you got to win your election. So be reasonable about what you're saying. I guess so. It just it seems like so much. Of the... Well, I guess you can confuse it and make it seem like it's not the same thing. But, uh, yeah, when I get there, I intend to investigate it. Thing. And it certainly sounds it's like a process he's... thing, right? Yeah, I guess so. You got to do the right process. That's all. I can vote for that. Yeah, I. I it's, a, it's always a weird thing to see people spending time on. Well, you know, are you for impeachment? Well, you know, and to, so you got to read the person. Do you mean? Am I supposed to say yes because I'm open to the possibility, or no because I'm only open to the possibility and haven't, you know? decided to we're, we're a nation of yeah. laws this is a rule of law kind of thing and we just need to follow this process that's all yeah well it's a good answer and uh yeah i don't, I don't know how people react to it and uh, sometimes you run into people that say unless you'll just say yes then i don't want to hear from you and uh well then you got a problem well you know whether hands. it's primaries or caucuses or rulings by the chair we've always made the point in this show that process is important and here's yet another different example hmm. <sighs> All right. Well, mm -hmm. let's see. Well, we'll got you there. there. I guess. I mean, I don't know what else to say to it except I. You know, I don't. I never really understood the the fight to begin with. I don't know why so much time gets spent on. You merely said you're open to the possibility. Yeah. What's wrong with that? I want you to commit to an answer. Well, that seems foolish. You know, what if he drops dead tomorrow? But then no. do I impeach then him? Are we talking about impeaching Pence? Uh, well, maybe. Got to have a process. Maybe, but, you know, we got to see where that goes. Yeah. Make me start it, <laughs> I guess you could say. I agree with you. Now, make me do it. Yeah, right? And if they don't recognize it, you can tell them the process. If it's good enough for FDR, that. it's good enough for me. Right. You've heard of that guy. He's a big yeah. Democrat. Right. Everything gets investigated, said Thomas M. Davis III, the Republican former chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, discussing the implications uh, for Trump. Yeah. You spend half your time answering subpoenas, digging up documents, and having your people appear before these committees. Frankly, your legacy is ruined at that point. I'm not sure he's making a case for us or for their side. Yeah, well, that's the, the kind of person he is. You can't tell. Yeah. Davis lost his gavel after the 2006 midterms, and Democrats spent the next two years hammering at President George W. Bush, using their power to elevate a national debate over the Iraq war, while also shedding light on other missteps, such as the firings of U.S. attorneys and the use of private email servers by White House political staffers, which, by the way, was a scandal back yes, then. Yes, right. In the old days. So, uh, yeah, I get that. And uh, that's a good thing. All right. Well, right. yeah. Well, you better get used to it because you're never getting rid of of that guy. He lives in the Washington D.C. area, so he hasn't been in office for a long, long time. But uh, we never stop having to hear from him because he's kind of a both sides are old school Republican, and because he's accessible to the D.C. market, we have to hear from him forever. And and that's why Newt Gingrich lives in the in the market too. He didn't go back to Georgia. And that's why we hear from him all the time. If you can make it to a studio in D.C. and have a suit, you are you're you got a career for life. OK, but, you know, here's also a reminder in this same article that a lot of the people in the Trump White House and those advising him aren't the brightest bulbs in the ceiling here, not that the sharpest true. knives in the drawer. Some outside Trump advisors have mused in recent days that losing the House would be a political disaster, but saw a silver lining in the possibility that Democrats would veer left next year and be a foil for Trump, according to two Republicans familiar with these discussions who are not authorized to speak publicly. In other words, they talked to the two Republicans who told this to Trump. Mm -hmm. 
those who served in the last GOP administration that dealt with the Democratic congressional majorities said Trump and his allies would be making a mistake to minimize the consequences. There's a never-ending stream of outrage, said Scott Jennings, a Republican political consultant who served in the final three years of the Bush White House. The only difference is now all your outrage is directed at Twitter, but when you give somebody a gavel, that can actually hurt you. Hmm. Sometimes. If bog officials and staffers from the most senior levels of government to the lower levels, their mission would be to stop the EPA or any other regulatory agency from just functioning, basically, until they can regain power. So I'm scratching my head and thinking, and this is a problem, why? Hmm. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I I mean, he's right. Yes. Uh, and the Trump people advising him saying it's no big deal. You get to be Harry Truman and run against Congress uh, are dumb. But, yeah. you know, hey, you know, we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out starting tomorrow. I guess so. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have no doubt that they don't know what they're getting into. Uh, on the it's, other it, hand, it reminds me of the people, you know, who <laughs> were in the majority and see their power threatened and say, oh, well, no big deal. We'll just be in the minority and we'll be able to actually be able to say what we want to say finally. And yeah, as you have pointed right. out and taught me over the years, you never want to be in the minority right. in the House, period. Losing is horrible. And uh, <clears throat> well, there's no uh, the power strip. You're powerless. Yeah. You can do nothing. You don't want that. Right. Uh, they, uh, however, have not really... I, you know, they, it's weird. They've never really had a serious taste of what you can do with an organized Congress, a congressional no, they majority. They can't do it in the majority. They yeah. Don't know how to do so it. I don't know how much they miss it. And they're not very smart people in the first place. And, you know, they, they put a very high value on being able to say whatever they want. That's like their primary motivator in life. Why they don't just do that in their house, I don't know, but. Well, you know, under the leadership of Jim G.Y.M. Jordan, uh, you know, we'll be able start? to see how that works. OK. Yeah, right. I'm sure everyone will be voting for him because he's so trustworthy. Um, but how did that start misspelling his name? I noticed that and I was I thought it was a typo at first. Uh, now, we start calling him that on Twitter. Yeah. All right. I, everything starts on Twitter. All right. Well, uh, yeah, there's uh which one were we reading from here? Which piece was that? Uh, Mike DeBone is Trump's worst political nightmare. Democrats with subpoena power. Ah, I'll just, yes, again, okay. we'll add it to the bottom of the list there so it's easily found. It's from the Pundit Roundup, but there it is. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll find it in there. Okay. Now I find it there. I think I did hear about this one happening over the weekend. And uh, I did have the one comment, which was I, I have actually seen Democrats gain subpoena power after having been in this position and it wasn't necessarily all that impressive a thing in all cases. And uh, they, there are some people who were there for it and who are now out of Congress who could tell you there's a lot of – there are some enormous frustrations that you can run into, particularly with a Republican administration as given to – well, as given to stonewalling as the W administration was – it was enormously frustrating and in many cases led nowhere. This one, they... Well, that's why it's interesting for the guy who was worse. in the W administration to say, no, it really had an impact because, like, you were slowing us down and really yes. making our lives miserable. Well, they wanted to do things, and I think this guy does not. And so, I, I don't... It won't... It may not change Well, we don't want it to do his, things. Yeah, right. That, that, that's fine. And I guess as long as... And that's the, the real answer is, as long as he's just railing and not able to do the things, that's a huge improvement. It, it is. Let him go to the rallies. It won't change his mind you know? about things. It won't change the Stay way he behaves. Washington. Right. Um, but uh, the good news would be, you know, th there won't... As long as there's nobody who will blindly attempt to translate his ravings into policy... That's all that really matters, and uh, it would be great if we could also get rid of him later. But this is definitely step one, and uh, you know whether or not the the subpoena power thing works out this time. You know, don't bet anything on it, but it does stop the process of translating Trump's ravings into policies that actually hurt people. Mm. So uh, I'll leave you with uh, those stories. I think they're all important. Yes, um, QAnon. Uh, Trump's lying and getting caught at it. The possibility of uh, getting a chamber back uh, starting tomorrow in Ohio 12 and keeping an eye on all those uh, primary and general election uh, uh, mentions we gave today on the show. I think they're all important. But I also want to leave you with this. Over the weekend, of course, Pope Francis said that killing people is wrong. 
including the death penalty. So Dr. Way. Robert Jeffress tweets, Pope Francis is dead wrong. <laughs> funny, funny use. Oh. Dead wrong about capital punishment. Really? How clever. God has commanded government to use the death penalty to demonstrate oh. the seriousness of murder and quotes the Old Testament, Genesis. And John Harwood tweets, Pope Francis or Robert Jeffress? Take your pick. Yeah, that's not hard. That's not a tough one, right? Also, who? <laughs> I don't know who we're talking about. I don't know. Okay. Let's ask Catholics. That is something. He's dead wrong about. I mean, okay, you know, whatever, man. I mean, I'm not necessarily convinced either, but I'm not Catholic. I don't know if this guy's Catholic, but also, you know, I I tend to say it in terms of, yeah, I'm not entirely convinced. But yeah, the old uh, boy is that Pope stupid line is probably not the way to go. Right. Oh, and I see this tweet just popped up just in time for the midterms. Republicans eye another ACA repeal vote if midterms go their way, as if Democrats aren't already running on health care as the issue that people care about the most. Yeah. Now they're going to help us by claiming that they're all in for repeal. Did that? So if the if the midterms go their way, are they saying? Yeah. I mean, next. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So next time. not before the midterms, but after the midterms, if they win. Oh, well, then I guess it wouldn't be a terrible risk for them to do that. Um, but, uh, well, okay. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Then it's a, a, a gamble over whether or not people stay well, mad for two years. What they're saying, repeal is like Fight Club, one mm -hmm. GOP operative told me. This is from Axios. First rule is not to talk about it. Really? What? Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a decent chance Republicans won't be in a position to try again. Yes. Right. Now, they might try again even if they lose. That's a possibility, too. But if but they win, if they hang on to their house, yeah. then this is the kind of crap that's coming. So just be aware when you decide whether okay. to stay home or whether to go vote. That's the best use of that article, I think. Yep. All right. I'll leave you with that uh, and uh, hope you're well. And I'll be back on Wednesday. We'll talk about primary results. Uh, again, this is one of those situations like Georgia 6 and it's like uh, uh, Pennsylvania – when uh, Connor Lamb was running, the fact that it's close at all is the story, yeah. but media will turn it into who won, who lost. Well, so yes. a one-point win on either side will be huge, but actually uh, this never should have been a close election in the first place. That's why Georgia 6 was important, even though Ossoff lost, and uh, you could see the difference between how that was covered after the fact and how Connor Lamb, who won, mm. was covered. True. And so uh, it, it's one of those narrative setters, if you're into that kind of thing. You, I guess you're not supposed to be, but yeah. Yeah, well, I had a piece over the weekend from John mm -hmm. Storr about how bad narrative can be because it distracts from telling people what's actually going on when you're wedded to the narrative. Ah. And here's a perfect example. It isn't just about who won and who lost. It's whether it's close or not. And that's telling us what we need to know about a blue wave for November. But yeah, more to talk about that too. on Wednesday. Okay, we'll be back on that wave thing. And I guess the wave, that'll be interesting because you could also have evidence at the end that the wave was there, but it didn't produce the numbers in Congress that you thought. Right, or the wave is there, but it hasn't crested yet, and a whole bunch mm -hmm. of stuff. Or that the wave is really there because it changes everything because the difference between a one-point win and a one-point loss is whether the poll was accurate or not. Mm. Yeah, well, that's true too. And there'll be a lot of, I'm sure, discussion about that. They're on the spot, the pollsters. A right. chance to redeem themselves. Okay, take care, and I'll talk to you Wednesday. Okay, very good. Thanks, Greg. And uh, where to now? Let's see. Oh, that's very, very interesting set of circumstances and a great set of stories too. I should take a look at the uh, Democrats with the gavel, Democrats with subpoena power thing, because I, yeah, I, I do remember seeing that one over the weekend and re really just responding to the headline, but. Guess what? Didn't really actually sit down and look thoroughly through the piece. But uh, yeah, well, I, I suppose. I mean, do we save it for after the midterms when we know the results? I guess so. I mean, that I guess that would be strategically better. Uh, if if the show were having an impact on turnout, then I guess you might counsel. Well, why don't you frame it as uh, helping uh, play down expectations immediately post-election 
if the Democrats were to regain control of the House and uh, as opposed to saying, well, uh, oversight on a, on an administration like this one tends to cause as many, if not more problems than it solves, except that's really and that's really the case for a W type administration, which awful as it was uh, filled everywhere with liars as it was and malicious liars at that they're still not quite as bad as the donald trump administration so i don't know i'm I'm worried about it because uh subpoena power depends as much as anything else on normality on the on on observing the norms of governance and the central tenet of this administration is that the norms of governance are not worth observing or they can't be observed because we never learned what they were might be a better explanation for the people at the very top, <clears throat> but uh, they will not be observed one way or the other. And so it becomes an issue. I've described things like this, you know, this situation to you in the past, and you probably are already recalling most of it and can see the concerns that are coming. The Democratic led congressional investigations issue subpoenas to members of the Trump administration. Members of the Trump administration either ignore the subpoenas or come and testify either falsely or withhold uh, any testimony that would help straighten things out, whatever it is. They refuse to produce documentation, whatever the, the, the method by which they defy the subpoena. Uh, and you remember perhaps how this play goes. The normal uh, recourse for the committee is to hold the witness in contempt and perhaps move that the House as a body hold that person in contempt or even that the entirety of the Congress, if they can get the concurrence of the Senate, hold that that witness in contempt. And then the question becomes, OK, now that you're, you know, being cited for contempt of Congress, how do we prosecute you for it? And the normal answer, of course, is refer the case to the U.S. attorney, normally the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, for prosecution under the statutory contempt of Congress uh, laws. And the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, of course, an employee of the Department of Justice, it's the Donald Trump Department of Justice, and you know how he treats his Department of Justice, and they simply say, well, just don't prosecute that. And, and that doesn't even necessarily violate the norms of governance at this point for the president or the, the the attorney general to direct the US attorney not to not to bother with this prosecution use your prosecutorial discretion at first and if people don't believe that then just take our direct orders for it and you know the contempt exists it's just what's missing here is the punishment and that's what matters to members of the Trump administration in particular, and really to every member of every administration. And so the options for enforcing those subpoenas beyond that are very few and very limited. Uh, some of them, you know, that include the things that they, the Democrats have been willing to threaten in the past is, well, you can make life extraordinarily difficult for people inside the department that is defying your subpoena if the person is a governmental uh, officer. You can hit them in the appropriations process. You can curtail their freedom to act on various issues and subjects. And, you know, if there, if those guys were actually interested in doing anything in particular, that might punish them. But since all they really seem to be interested in is flying around on government planes, you could try to hit them on that. They could try to find their way around it. They could just cheat. I mean, remember, they're there to steal anything that isn't nailed down. And it would be great if you drove them to do something so extraordinarily open and stupid that you could simply arrest them and deal with it that way. But it's not often the case that we get to that. 
Of course, you know, other possibilities include, well, you, you can impeach federal officials, but we're all scared about that. And so that's and that's also a pretty blunt instrument. And do you really necessarily have to impeach somebody over their refusal to turn over a document? Well, it depends on what the document is. Then there's also the old inherent contempt procedure, and that scares the crap out of everybody, too. Uh, although it would be really great. I mean, you know, I wonder if you would appeal in some ways to the MAGA crowd. I, I guess there's probably among the uh, thousands of them, There's there's got to be one somewhere, even if he's the only one, who uh, would say at least to himself, well, you know, I'm for the whole lock him up, lock her up. I love chanting lock him up, lock her up. It's fun. And uh, I dare my public uh, officers to to do something like that. And uh, I would respect them if they would just have the guts to do it. And then even if a Democrat actually had the guts and did it to a to a Trump Republican, they might say, well, I like the cut of his jib. I like that guy's moxie. Remember, these are old people uh, that do this stuff. And uh, so I guess there's always could be one, but I think the vast majority are just basically gimme Tarians. I meant lock the other side up, not my side. I'm not for decisive action by the government per se in locking up criminals. I'm for winning political arguments and putting my opponents in, in jail. And that's not what happened here. So I don't know. I, the, the the options are the same, and only this time we're facing an possibly even more abnormal and more sociopathic administration than we faced the last time around. And that doesn't excuse anything about the way the W administration was run. It was sociopathic in its own right. It was just a different approach and less you know took less glee, I think, in being revealed as sociopathic than this one does so, but you know yeah just basically i'd rather have the gavel and subpoena power than not have it i just have yet to see anybody really satisfy we, me with their use of it welcome back now to the kgo in the morning show here on netroots radio and uh let's see maybe we should round up some of the comments that have come in this morning and see if there's any redirection on the line in terms of what we ought to be covering and some of the comments that came over the weekend might likewise uh, redirect us just a little bit but from this morning uh, justice commenting on the uh, QAnon situation saying that maybe the FSB told Mike Flynn Jr. that they discovered that QAnon is a leftist hoax out of the KGB playbook and <laughs> And so therefore, yes, taking instructions from Russia, we found out that it was a hoax and it could be. I mean, the whole thing really could have been just a an effort, a leftist trolling effort, could be a right wing trolling effort. I really I, I couldn't tell you uh, what the I mean, I, nobody knows for sure. But there is I guess it's plausible that it could have been either uh, approached from either angle or uh, you know totally apolitical in the sense of I don't root for one team or the other but uh, I'm just a cynical jerk and I hate politics in general and I want to make fun of people who take politics seriously that could be it very interesting though and uh, I guess that's the answer of what it takes to undermine QAnon is to you got to find the right formula I'm sure it's been tried before somebody I'm I'm positive out there has attempted to plant the rumor that QAnon really is a, a leftist trolling the right <clears throat> because it's what it looks like. So I imagine it was a pretty easy assumption to make. Uh, but I bet it's been tried before and it just didn't take root. And sometimes it just takes a, you know, a stroke of luck or a bigger name with more followers saying it. And uh, that's what it takes to, to get it to catch on. Whatever it is, I, I'll take it. I'm, I, I'm glad this is, uh, I, I, I think it's formulaic. What it takes to pull down a conspiracy theory is a more attractive conspiracy theory. I don't know. That does never, I've never been able to conceptualize something that I thought would work that was that one step crazier than whatever the conspiracy theorists were already saying. 
my mind usually just doesn't go in those directions, or at least I like to think it doesn't, and maybe it does, and I don't realize what I'm doing when I'm theorizing things for you guys that I really am, you know, just imagining something that will work for our audience. Is that all that this is really all about? Maybe. I mean, you know, oh, there's no objective truth out there. <sighs> Hard to say. Anyway, uh, let's see other comments coming in here. Ah, all right, let's see. Lisa sends us this one. Let's open it up here. Lisa Iannucci, thank you, by the way, for the your level of participation is appreciated. Lots of articles suggested over the weekend and during the shows that uh, sometimes we just can't get to. Sometimes we get to in a roundabout fashion. This time she is sending us Manu Raju's tweet. I guess he's covering the story of Rand Paul in Russia for CNN and uh I don't think we made any particular mention of it in the last couple of days, but yeah, Rand Paul has now, for some reason, felt the call, you know, he's heeding the call, uh, to, to go to visit the Russians in Moscow. It was important that Rand Paul, senator from Kentucky, show up in Moscow, and uh, no, like, really good explanation for that, I guess. His fans would say, well, it's always good to reach out and understand people on the other side of the world and people who are geopolitical adversaries who might become friends or maybe they should be our friends now or maybe they are our friends now, as they like to theorize. We have some things in pocket we might pull out to continue that theme. But what's he doing there? Well, so far, uh, he's issuing this statement. Rand Paul says from Moscow, according to Manu Raju, I am pleased to, an, well, announce, I guess is what he means. It says I am pleased to announce. And if if that's the case, then, boy, I don't know what to tell you. I am pleased to announce that we will be continuing this contact. In other words, I am now a Russian agent. We agreed and we invited members of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Russia to come to the U.S. to meet with us in the U.S., in Washington, Paul said today. And i that's not like it's actually really huge news or anything. Okay, some lawmakers from the United States go to Russia. Some, you would expect, reciprocation. Some lawmakers from Russia are going to come to America. Now, I don't know if that's a great idea because they'll likely recruit more spies and convert more American assets that way. But, you know. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. That's that's one of those things that falls under uh, regular cover. You know, uh, we have the normally we have these sorts of exchanges all the time. Now we're doing them for the purposes of spying and undermining the mission of the United States. But you know, we're members of the legislature, and in normal times we have these exchanges, and so it can't be called suspect on its face. Of course, if, you know, American legislators magically walk away doing Russia's bidding and Russian legislators magically walk away still doing Russia's bidding, then that would be, you know, you could classify that as a bad thing for America in general, even if you can't point to anything illegal happening uh, or you just don't get the information that allows you to point out what that illegal thing is. But it's good cover, just like national prayer breakfasts. You're allowed to have breakfast. You're allowed to pray. You're allowed to ask that people not film you praying. But if that's just cover for illegal lobbying, then it's bad news, and we're going to have to fight our way through your cover story. But there's nothing on its face illegal or wrong about a bunch of people getting together at breakfast time, even if they want to pray. That's supposedly still their right, unless they want to pray to something other than Jesus, in which case you're under arrest, as you know how that goes. All right, Mad Hatter pointing out also another close race happening uh, in Texas, and it's true, and we are getting drips and drabs of that story. Mostly I'm getting uh, emails about how ridiculous Ted Cruz's television commercials are, though whether they're actually airing, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, the most ridiculous so-called commercials are nothing more than YouTube videos. But let's see. Uh, Okay. Uh, Oh, look at this. The Hill has news that a 
gun rights group, and I'm not sure which one it is. If it was the NRA, they usually go ahead and say so. But if it's Gun Owners of America, they usually don't bother. I wonder if I'm curious to see who did Ah, the Connecticut Citizens Defense League. So, okay, another one of the the minor players in the fringes of the gun debates. Gun rights group pulls endorsement for GOP candidate over criticism of 3D printed guns. Just interesting to note. This, this stupid 3D printed gun thing continues to be a story. Um, you know, and with good reason, it worries people. But, uh, you know, not, not a top issue, I don't think, even among the, the gun debaters. But uh, okay, if they want to sow discord in the Republican ranks over it, I'm happy to do that. Wait till they find out that it's a liberal online hoax or something like that. All right, let's see. So I'll just keep that story. Uh, yes, though, the uh, Beto O'Rourke is uh, making a, a run in Texas and making a, a competitive race of it. Ted Cruz, of course, shooting himself in the foot at every turn and and helping with that effort. But, uh, yeah, first things first, tomorrow in Ohio. Let's see. Uh, Mighty OCD weighing in with the comment, of course, that the only objective truth is that Armando is somewhere telling someone they are wrong. And that seems to be true. Last week he was in New Orleans likely telling some of you that you were wrong, although usually he spends his time face to face quite amicably although he'll still tell you you're wrong um he, you, you might imagine he's screaming behind his computer screen when in fact he's simply saying oh, you're wrong and i'll i'll just happily discuss with you why that's the case all right let's see other things that might have uh suggested themselves over the weekend and been put aside oh boy there's an awful lot um and let's see if I can figure that out. Oh, no, this this should definitely not be in pocket. I simply hit the wrong button. But if you wanted to know what the dinner menu was at the uh, Ford's Fish Shack <laughs> restaurant, I have that for you in pocket. Delete. Am I sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I can. One, I think I know where to get that menu again if I need it. And two, nobody's really interested. We did go, by the way, and it was a fine a fine dinner out with the kids at camp, a um, little on the expensive side when it comes to the uh, the fun shellfish seafood, but that's the way it goes, dining on crab inland. Okay, so there, we've summarized that story for you. Uh, let's see. Man, there's a lot going on here. Uh, let's run through a couple of things here. Uh don't usually turn this way. An Ezra Klein piece in Vox, which usually, you know, though they make good points, uh, do so in ponderous and meandering ways. But uh, this one really grabbed me for some reason. Amusing ourselves to Trump. A reference, of course, to amusing ourselves to death. This, uh, this one felt interesting to me. We are buried under ignorance disguised as information. This may be somewhat poorly timed in the sense that the uh, well, a, a large part of the ignorance uh, web may be collapsing or maybe it's very well timed as a complimentary piece to the QAnon thing if we are watching it collapse in real time or perhaps uh, if we're being too optimistic about that reminding ourselves just how bad things are. In his classic 1985 book Amusing Ourselves to Death Neil Postman wrote of the difference between George Orwell's and Aldous Huxley's visions of fascism. Interesting start, right? Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information, wrote Postman. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Interesting. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. So far, it's looking like Huxley has the upper hand here. Postman's warning ran out in a different era, rang out in a different era. He worried over the rise of television, not Twitter. Easily mistaken, I guess. And who could have foreseen Twitter, really? He was reacting to Ronald Reagan, not Donald Trump. Ronald, not Donald. And yet, the facts of our age are more absurd and insulting than anything Postman prophesied. That's not hard to believe. 
The point of amusing ourselves to death is that societies are molded by technologies atop which they communicate. Oral cultures teach us to be conversational. Typographic cultures teach us to be logical. Televised cultures teach us that everything is entertainment. So what is social media culture teaching us? That's always a good question. And uh, I don't know if this is uh, really going to answer it or not, but it's a worthy inquiry. It can be heard, it can, or it can be hard uh, to read Postman today. Much of his argument scans as crankiness, and some of the world he describes, writing as he was before the dawn of Facebook and Twitter and search engine optimization and autoplay videos, ooh, those autoplay videos, feels like a golden age. This is a manifesto in which Sesame Street with its mission of making learning fun, serves as a villain because children shouldn't be taught that education is just another form of entertainment. Hmm. Uh, And yet, the world we live in is both the sort of dystopia Postman feared and worse than anything he dared predict. The President of the United States emerged out of reality television, cable news, and caps lock tweeting. And his great gift, if you call it that, is his ability to own our attention in the precise ways those mediums own our attention. By stoking conflict, deepening grievance, starting fights, and turning everything, absolutely everything, into can't-look-away entertainment. That is a pretty apt description of what's happening now. What's newsworthy in an age of entertainment? He asks next. A few weeks ago, I was at CNN's D.C. Bureau to tape Brian Stetler's Reliable Sources show. That's not worthy, by the way. This was the day the Environmental Protection Agency's astonishingly corrupt director, Scott Pruitt, resigned, and Trump named Bill Shine, the Fox News executive ousted for covering up a culture of sexual assault, as deputy chief of staff. But all around me, the televisions were replaying clips from the previous night's Trump rally where he had insulted John McCain, Elizabeth Warren, and George H.W. Bush. There was nothing new in Trump's mockery. Neither his targets nor his language was fresh. But he had wrenched the media's attention in his direction anyway. I went on a bit of a rant about this. The clip went viral. (laughs) And so we blame you now. And some of my colleagues in the media got defensive. As if what the president says, even repeatedly, isn't newsworthy. Shot back Paul Fahey, the Washington Post's media reporter. But that's precisely the point. While everything a president says is newsworthy in theory, virtually nothing that most presidents say is newsworthy in practice. Ah, see, this is what I say. I don't listen to anything that they say. I wait to see what happens. But okay, because I'm maybe I'm more interested in the practice. But okay. President Obama, like Presidents Bush and Clinton before him, put endless time into painstakingly crafted speeches and carefully chosen locales, laying out energy policy and tax ideas and defenses of his record. They didn't get a tenth of the coverage that Trump's rallies got. Sometimes they got no coverage at all, particularly on cable news, where entertainment value reigns supreme. To say something is newsworthy isn't to distinguish it much. The world is full of newsworthy events, comments, reports, facts, people. But the media's capacity is limited. There are only so many reporters, so much space on the front page, so many minutes in prime time. The competition is fierce. And an almost endless number of important stories are being ignored. What Trump is able to do is crowd many of these stories out, not just the ones that are damaging to him, but also the ones that have nothing to do with him, which he views as being damaging to him. The stories that speak to bigger and deeper questions in our world. Uh, All valid observations, although, uh, and he probably gets to it later, I mean, the advent of what we dismiss as entertainment media, whether it's social media or other spaces on the internet, actually sort of make, uh, render the capacity issues of the traditional media moot. But I guess, you know, the larger point here is that you also fill that space 
and any other space you create to make up for, you know, the crowding. Uh, if you fill it all with garbage, then I guess uh, you're still – it still only leaves you with the fact that the other media to which most people still turn for most of their information is still – a limited one and then if the you know if people among the millions who get their information or who try to get their information from mass media like traditional mass media television newspapers etc find themselves frustrated at their inability to find the kind of information they need then they just know they can turn to the internet and get it even if it isn't true uh so uh i guess i'm working on a bit of a hybrid theory on that one except i'll never actually work it out and write anything about it we'll just ponder it here on the on the radio this this is my work this is my medium i don't blog anymore i still tweet but uh this is where we work these things out and then we do a good rant on it and people like it and i get notes from the editors at daily coast that say write that down and i feel like uh the moment is gone we said it and it's out there which is too bad because it doesn't get as much play. Writing still gets the most play, believe it or not, even uh, in the age of the Internet. Okay, well, let's see. So, uh, yes, there's the ability Donald Trump has to crowd out everything, whether it's damaging to him or has nothing to do with him at all. Or, well, for that matter, I guess he, he could crowd out news that's good about him with more news that's good about him, except none of that exists. The media is uncomfortable with the fact that we are constantly deciding what does and doesn't deserve coverage, and so we duck behind a definition of newsworthiness that suggests it is a synonym for importance. That's true. And if we're just covering the most important story at any given moment, then we're not making choices so much as reflecting existing reality, and who could criticize us for that? But the true definition of newsworthiness is some combination of shocking and entertaining and important. Otherwise, we just cover deaths from malaria and the warming of the planet all day. <laughs> Interesting counterpoint there. That's particularly true in the hyper-competitive enclaves of cable news and social media, where, the, where only the most attention-grabbing, conflict-rich content thrives. The media has no problem ignoring the president when what he says is boring and predictable. It's when he's outrageous or absurd that the breaking banners light up that's an awful incentive structure, as Trump's gleeful manipulation of our attention has shown. And I'm sure there are probably a number of you out there uh, who either are jumping up and down to say something like this or are sitting on your hands uh, and saying, of course, this probably won't even get mentioned, or maybe even if it does, so what? It's been so obvious for so long, and, but uh, we might as well make the point that, uh, yeah, I mean, we know what drives the interest in the shocking and click-worthy? And the answer is, of course, that the mechanisms through which we get our important news, whatever that might mean, are in the end commercial ventures. And so it is the demands, you know, I guess to, to make it sound really uh, annoying, the demands of capitalism that... Uh, that drives all of this. We have to make dollars here. We got to be click worthy in order to satisfy the people who are underwriting this broadcast, our, our ability to use this medium to bring you news, whether it's really important news or not. And that's just going to mean clicks. And sometimes that means at least some significant portion of your precious airtime or print space is going to have to be filled with the sorts of things that idiots consider important so that money keeps flowing to us so that we can spend that minority of that the time and space that we have on things that we actually do think are important. All right. So that's what he was, I think, what he's getting at here with the particularly true in the hyper-competitive enclaves of cable news and social media. Uh, and yet, it's damn hard to resist all of this. It's damn hard to resist because Trump's behavior really is so outlandish and because if everyone else is covering Trump's latest comments, you feel like you're missing the story if you focus elsewhere. And because there really is audience demand and because Trump rallies make for damn good TV segments and Facebook posts, and I say this as someone whose coverage is just as driven by these incentives as anyone else's, so at least he's aware of this, Trump knows all of this. He is a genius, and I hate to 
invoke that word with him, even when it's about being an idiot. <clears throat> He's a genius at understanding the dynamics of press coverage, and it's allowed him to hack the media brilliantly to even make critical coverage part of his strategy and storyline. He controls our attention more effectively than any president in memory, perhaps than any president in history. He would love that. But at what cost? We normalized the media that normalized Donald Trump is the next section here. Since Trump was elected, the bookshelves and op-ed pages have been alive with fears of Orwellian fascism. Fears that for the most part remain far from manifesting, but even as Orwell's dystopia has failed to materialize, Huxley's dystopia has. We are buried under ignorance disguised as information. There's your QAnon for you. And confused by entertainment masquerading as news, distracted by a dizzying procession of lies and outrages and ginned up controversies, inured to misbehavior and corruption that would have consumed past administrations, we have lost control of our attention, if not of our government. Well, we've lost control of that too. It is hard to read this paragraph from Postman without feeling he is speaking specifically about us. And that's what always makes a good book, novel, or otherwise, right? When Orwell wrote in his famous essay, The Politics of the English Language, that politics has become a matter of defending the indefensible, he was assuming that politics would remain a distinct, although corrupted, mode of discourse. His contempt was aimed at those politicians who would use sophisticated versions of the age-old arts of doublethink, propaganda, and deceit. That the defense of the indefensible would be conducted as a form of amusement did not occur to him. He feared the politician as deceiver, not as entertainer. The chaotic swirl of information, anger, conflict, identity, performance, and trivia that characterizes the Trump's governance also characterizes the mediums that created him. For all the talk of normalizing Trump, it was our normalization of the platforms he thrived on, reality television, cable news, and Twitter, that made Trump possible. Could Trump have won the Republican primary in the presidency in the days before he could call into cable news shows at will, get his rallies carried live on television, drive media coverage from the comfort of his Twitter account? Could he have won if we hadn't come to see our politicians as entertainers, to believe the conflict, or rather to believe conflict, the true story of governance, to connect the quantity of media coverage with the quality of candidates? I doubt it. It's a good point, a good question. To be unaware that a technology comes equipped with a program for social change, to maintain that technology is neutral, to make the assumption that technology is always a friend to culture, is at this late hour, stupidity, plain and simple, postman warned, even before all this stuff, right? We have been, to our credit, alert to the dangers of Orwellian tyranny, we have been much less vigilant against the threat of Huxleyan distraction. Yes, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Everyone says, it's Orwellian, positively Orwellian what he's doing. Well, it's positively Huxleyan, but that's more difficult to just plain, I mean, just me more difficult to say. I was going to say, I mean, I guess it could be the fact that more people read the Orwell work than the Huxley work, but I mean, it's pretty popular work, so I don't know. Anyway, but a good good observation. Much less vigilant against the threat of Huxley and distraction. Trump manages the government clumsily, but he controls public attention masterfully. He is showing daily how the truth can be drowned under a sea of irrelevance, how easily the defense of the indefensible can go down if it is cast as entertainment. The politicians who follow him will learn his lessons. Will the rest of us? And it's a, it's a good question and a good warning. Uh, well worth thinking about. I don't, uh, I don't ordinarily indulge uh, Ezra for quite that long, and sometimes it's because 
well, in order to indulge Ezra, it would take twice as long, but a rather a, a compact piece from from Ezra, Ezra Klein on this one, and I think a, a great point. All right, coming up on our next break, we'll take this opportunity to regroup for a few minutes and decide which of the 10,000 directions we might go in next. There are so many, and uh, it's difficult to, to choose which one is the most important because we're distracted by entertainment. Oops, I forgot to get our music rolling here, and so we'll have to uh, jump out of it early, and that'll make for editing nightmares later. And, uh, well, you know, you don't need to know all the ins and outs of the post-production world, but I can tell you this, I'm going to be annoyed later on. So why don't we take uh, a little extra time? Two more seconds. (laughs) And now, take our two-minute break. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kago in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We have uh, let the music screw us up a little bit longer than usual, but I told you we are going to take a couple extra seconds on our little break here. But, uh, man, all right. Now we got to fade things out. You see, it causes all kinds of problems. So I spent the two minutes plus just sort of uh, thumbing through the articles that are stored away here on... Uh, on pocket and of course our fade out didn't work very well either so all kinds of technical issues making life difficult this morning but uh essentially the result is uh there are just too many things to cover and we'll just never get to them all but uh, that's not new i did however scroll far enough back that i discovered something that we should say all right let's switch gears And put this on the record. A lot of these other things are further commentary on issues we've raised. But this one, I think, uh, while connected to Trump Russia, uh, represents an angle that we have ignored to date and that is important and that I feel needs to be on the record. Natasha Bertrand, again, at the center of this one. Congratulations to her on her continuing good work and the work of all the people at the Atlantic who seem to bring us such interesting material uh, all the time on Trump Russia and so many other outlets as well. And as we discover other bits and pieces, we'll credit them. This one from July 30th, uh, we really need to take notice of. This one really, I think, unites some very interesting themes, including, uh, of course, Trump Russia and the influence of the Russians globally and the theme of... Yes, sometimes the system is designed in ways that can be specifically gamed by bad actors uh, because they were designed to give certain deference, you know, to grant certain deference to other, to to the the various players in the system um, because they were designed with good faith use of the system in mind and that might have been a giant mistake. And, you know, how else do you really approach designing something other than to hope that it's always used in good faith? And, you, you know, uh, all, all all systems should be red teamed ahead of time so you can figure out what troublemakers, trolls, idiots and bad faith actors of various kinds are going to do with it and try to prevent it. But sometimes it just gets in the way of getting things done and moving on with the business of the world. What are we talking about here? Natasha Bertrand's piece in The Atlantic, How Russia Persecutes Its Dissidents 
using U.S. courts. Yeah, those those U.S. courts that, you know, I mean, it's difficult to believe. Why would U.S. courts assume good faith by anyone? They're, you know, in the business of dealing with uh, acts usually perpetrated in bad faith. So you know that it happens. But when you're dealing with other entities other or other foreign entities and governments, uh, though it wouldn't necessarily be the case that we're, you know, uh, assuming that they act in good faith, there are certain norms that we thought most people would stick to in government to government dealings because as repeat players, it simply doesn't make sense to pull the wool over the eyes of others with enough frequency that you are no longer trusted as a partner in international activity. But here we are. Russia's requests for to Interpol, the International Police Agency, Interpol for red notices, the closest instrument that exists, I guess, to an international arrest warrant. Russia's requests to Interpol for red notices against Kremlin opponents are being met with increasing deference by the Department of Homeland Security. So not just regular deference, but increasing deference. And of course, the deference is increasing because Donald Trump is in command of the, you know, well, I, I, why even bother giving him that credit? He's he's supposed to be the president, and we're supposed to listen to what the president says when it comes to setting our own policies here and at home. And uh, that's the way our system is designed. And like I said, there's not much out there in the way of fail safes uh, with respect to what to do when the person to whom you have granted all this deference in your system is an insane idiot. Let's get to the specifics of the story because Natasha spent some time organizing her thoughts and I've spent none. So why not the deference, give the deference here to Natasha. Oh, it's been updated. The story they wanted you to note uh, in italics up front. And it was updated at 1130 on the day that it was updated. Super important. A little more than six years ago, Sasha, whoever that is, was on his way to a meeting of Russia's pro-democracy. Yay, we're pro-democracy. Yabloko party. I don't know what that means in Russian, but I hope it sounds intelligent because Yabloko in uh, English sounds particularly stupid. Yabloko party in the tiny Russian Republic of Kalmykia. I don't even think I was aware of that republic. Uh, clearly, there are dozens of which I am not aware, and only some of them make it into the news. This is a new one on me, literally. I'm not a Russian expert or whatever. Uh, okay. So he's on his way to a meeting of the pro-democracy Yabloko party in the tiny Russian Republic of Kalmykia when he was pulled into an unmarked black car by two plainclothes police officers. Bad news anywhere in Russia or Russian republics. He was interrogated for three days about his prior activity with the party, his lawyers told me, and his captors demanded that he sign a confession that mentioned something about a kidnapping but they wouldn't tell him what his crime was. Remember, these are the people that Trump and his supporters admire so much because they're strong. And therefore, you know, that's one of the reasons you're supposed to be worried, uh, particularly in combination with people showing up at his rallies wearing shirts, dumb shirts. Say, I'd rather be Russian than be a Democrat. They, they've already, you know, I, I know a lot of people rolled their eyes at this thing and say, I, you know, is he real? Where is he going with this? They're just joking, right? I don't know. Why not? Why wouldn't it sat would it not satisfy his supporters if he came out and gave a speech and in his speech after the press is the enemy of the people thing say Democrats are the enemy of the people. We should outlaw the Democratic Party. You know, lots of Republicans love to joke about that all the time. He would say he's joking, but you wouldn't ever be able to tell the difference. Uh so suppose that was it. You know, I I I I say this because as I'm explaining I, in the last couple of days over the weekend to my mom's discussing with her and my wife discussing to talking about the QAnon stuff and how could people be so dumb to believe this sort of thing? And remember, you know, they're being told that they should wear this. Uh, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat story uh, on their T-shirt because, you know, how could you believe such a thing? Is it tongue in cheek? We don't know for sure, but they probably do, you know, believe they'd rather be, 
anything than a Democrat because what are they learning a Democrat is? Oh, Democrats aren't a real political party. It's a pedophilia ring. They're trafficking in children. They're going to arrest thousands of them any minute. That's what Trump is really working on. That's what Mueller is really working on. And you'll see. And I guess, you know, you roll your eyes and say, how could it be that such people exist? How could you be so dumb as to be convinced of that? Well, you know, last year, these were the people who were busy telling you on the Internet that it was completely compatible with the First Amendment freedom of religion to ban Muslims from entering the country. Why? Because Muslims aren't, you know, Islam isn't a real religion. It's, a, you know, either it's a cult or it's a... It's a satanic thing or a moon worship cult. They don't even worship the same God. It's it's not a cult at all. It's a political ideology. You know, it says, well, it could be all of these things, I guess, depending on who you're asking. In Saudi Arabia, it's a political ideology, right? In several, you know, majority Muslim countries, are, it's a theocracy. So in those countries, it is a political philosophy. It was maybe even intended at the time before, you know, people drew lines between political philosophies and religious philosophies. I'm sure they would have told you it was a political philosophy. It was meant for governance of people's lives. And so, you know, I guess they wouldn't see that as unusual, uh, nor would anybody have told you anything different about Christianity, I guess, at a certain time. But OK, anyway, back to the story, because Natasha's done the work here. I haven't. I'm just pointing these things out along the way. That's, but that's why I'm here. Otherwise, you could just read this in the paper yourself. All right. After seven months in prison, I think the point I was trying to make here was actually that uh, it, it would be a simple next step to convince Trump supporters that it's a good thing for the country to pull Democrats into black sedans with unidentified police officers, question tortured, imprisoned, whatever, because Democrat. You think it can't happen in this country, but if you think you are arresting, harassing, torturing, imprisoning a person who you have genuinely come to believe is part of an international pedophilia ring, you probably feel a lot better about it. And it doesn't bother you that, you know, the real reason you've done it is that they're a Democrat, because to be a Democrat means to be these things, just as we learned last year that to be a Muslim meant to be a terrorist. They definitely believe that. Is it really hard for them to believe that being a Democrat is the other thing, especially if it's been hidden from them by the deep state all this time? Seven months in prison. And afterwards, Sasha, whose full name is being withheld by The Atlantic at his lawyer's request, pleaded guilty without knowing why. In court, weeks later, Russian prosecutors revealed the substantive case against him for the first time. Sasha, along with two others, had been accused and convicted of kidnapping someone, holding him in an apartment, and beating him repeatedly with a hammer. Sasha maintains that he never learned who the alleged victim was. No photo was ever submitted into the criminal record. But he served a brief prison sentence and was released on probation in December of 2012, at which point he fled to the United States on a B-2 tourist visa and applied for asylum at the end of 2013, which sounds like a pretty reasonable thing to do under those circumstances. Now, you know, in Russia, they don't afford you the same rights that we're supposed to afford you here, and very often we don't afford our own people the rights we're supposed to afford them. Uh, but, you know, it seems like a ridiculous thing. It wouldn't happen in the United States. You can't be convicted without being told what your crime is, without confronting your accusers, without something, something. In Russia, you can be. And for those who would rather be Russian than a Democrat, it's pretty clear that what that means is that in America, they wish it would be. They wish they could round people up who were political opponents and charge them with something, whether it's beating them with a hammer because they feel like they made that up or because whether it's uh, pedophilia and running a pedophile ring because they believe that's been proven on QAnon discussion boards and that ought to be enough for anybody. They wish they could do this. And that's, again, the danger that lurks behind this. But we were always satisfied that A, that had never happened here and that B, if you were able to escape the system or be released from prison or whatever it is over in Russia. Uh, you know, we always existed as the shining city on a hill, the beacon of hope. You could escape to America if you were being persecuted. If you don't like it in Russia, because <laughs> you don't like being persecuted for your pro-democracy activities, you can always flee to America. And this is the issue here. 
Now you can no longer flee to America. This is how total the control is over in Russia and why it should scare the living daylights out of people in Russia that Trump is a Putin puppet. You know, uh, they might, you know, the, the Russians might have otherwise said, good, now you get a taste of your own medicine. Now you get to see what it's like to live under Putin there in America. And they might be justified in thinking so, perhaps, but uh, it also deprives them of asylum in America. It's not just the uh, brown people who can't get asylum in America. Now white people can't get asylum in America if they are enemies of Putin because Trump's no puppet, no puppet, no puppet. Moving on. Sasha maintains that he never learned about the who the alleged victim was. No photo ever submitted. All of this happens. He served his prison sentence. He comes to the United States on a tourist visa and applies for asylum. I want to defect. I guess it's no longer defection. I want asylum. I'm persecuted in my country. They arrest me. They trump up charges. They keep me in prison, all because I'm a pro-democracy activist. And in America, you would say... Well, welcome to America. You've made it to freedom. We will defend you from those baddies over there in Russia. But guess what? In October of 2017, Sasha and his wife were driving to work in Atlanta when they were pulled over by ICE, baby, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Officers. ICE, the people, abolish ICE. They're terrorizing the brown people. They're terrorizing everybody. Whoever Trump orders them to terrorize, that's the problem so far with ICE. Do we need immigration laws? Yeah. Do we need officers? Sure. These guys? No. Under this direction? No. This structure that allows this sort of stuff to happen? No. Put them in a different department. Call them something else. Start over. Train them again. That's all. They told Sasha, these ICE officers, that the International Criminal Police Organization, or Interpol, and they really ought to think about just making it the International Police Organization, because the Criminal Police Organization makes it sound like they're the criminals, though maybe they are. But they told him that Interpol had issued a red notice at Russia's behest, alerting authorities that he had violated the terms of his probation by traveling to the U.S. years earlier, where he sought asylum. So now we have a situation where the long arm of the law, as long as it's Putin's long arm, which is very strong, can now reach across and the water and grab back defectors to the United States, and the United States is rounding them up for them because we're for freedom and we love our national sovereignty and enforcing international laws for cucks. But here we go. Much attention has been paid to Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election and the fear of a repeat in the upcoming midterms. We paid attention to it just a few minutes ago. Less examined, however, has been Russia's abuse of Interpol, the good guys, and the American court system, the good guys, to persecute the Kremlin's rivals in the United States. A problem that the Atlantic Council described in a recent report as another form of interference by Russia. Russia's request to Interpol to issue red notices. Now, back in the Soviet days, did we pay attention to what they wanted over at Interpol, or do we say, no, they're conniving bastards over there. We don't trust any of the red notices. And besides which, come on, red notices. But now they're our friends, so we do it. Yay. Russia's request to Interpol to use red notices, the closest instrument to an international arrest warrant in use today, against Kremlin opponents are being met with increasing deference, not defiance, but deference by the Department of Homeland Security, according to immigration attorneys and experts in transnational crime and corruption with whom I spoke. Very, very interesting. And I, you could see how that might have crept in even under prior administrations. Well, we're looking for Muslim terrorists. What do you mean, Muslim? You're looking for Muslim? We're looking for Muslim terrorists. We'll handle that. Oh, but these are Chechen Muslim terrorists. Oh, well, so Chechen rebels, Chechen separatists. Yes, but violent ones who are, you know, terrorists, not people standing up for self-determination. And, you know, it's a close call when you use terrorism as your tool. But then, you know, from there, it's easy to see, particularly if someone who's, you know, maybe wrongly overly trusting of Russia uh, starts to believe anything they tell them about what a danger this person is, and maybe a danger to you, too. He could be infiltrating. He could be setting up a, uh, a terrorist sleeper cell as we speak. 
Interpol cannot compel, this is the problem with Interpol, cannot compel any member country to arrest an individual who is the subject of a red notice. I say it's the problem, and it might now be the, the redemption of Interpol, and you can see why the system was designed this way. No country was willing to accept an international agency directing its own internal police units. But you can strongly suggest, and then if your own process warrants the arrest, extradition, whatever, you go ahead and do it. Uh, that's left to the discretion of the country. When the discretion of the country, though, is then embodied by Donald Trump, you can see where problems might arise. Instead of going, instead of saying, as president, I'm sympathetic to this, but there's a process, take it to the Department of Justice, and they will, in nonpartisan fashion, investigate the value of this notice. Here, they just say, well, it's left to the discretion of the president and by uh, delegation to the attorney general. And those guys just say, hey, whatever Putin wants, we'll just do it. And there's no inquiry because this is within their discretion. Normally, there's a report, there's facts generated, and you can point to those things as evidence, but you don't need to. It's just good practice. It's a norm. Under this administration, it's taken literally. Look, it's at the discretion of the White House slash Department of Justice. Discretion's been issued. Here it is. Go get that guy. Interpol cannot compel any member country to arrest an individual, uh, according to its guidelines. And the United States does not consider a red notice alone to be a sufficient basis for the arrest of a subject because it does not meet the requirements for arrest under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, according to the Justice Department. But the Department of Homeland Security and U.S. immigration courts are effectively facilitating backdoor extraditions, as one immigration attorney said, in their reliance on red notices as a basis for detention and ultimately removal. The Department of Justice, in other words, has troubling regulations and red tape that goes with interpreting red notices and what to do about them. However, the Department of Homeland Security doesn't have that guideline. What if we just use them to do the arresting? They've got cops, ICE. Besides which, this guy came in on a tourist visa and he's still here. Well, he was granted asylum. Yeah, but we don't, we ignore, we want to strip citizenship from people. What's wrong with stripping tourist visas from people? Brendan Rady, R-A-E-D-Y, a spokesman for ICE, told me that it is the agency's, quote, responsibility to carefully vet any alleged Russian criminal violator that has come to the United States and make the very best and most educated determination of whether the individual is indeed a criminal. Do they present an ongoing threat? Are they fleeing criminal prosecution? Or have they lied about their criminal activity in order to gain entry to the United States? Rady noted that ICE has attache offices who vet criminal slash fugitive leads to ensure that the individual in question is a true criminal and not simply a political target of those in power. Well, that's good lip service given at the end. But of course, the beginning of the quote is pretty scary in Trump, the Trump era, right? We carefully vet any alleged Russian criminal violator. So, you know, right. The argument would go, well, you're all worried about mob bosses and money launderers. You don't want us to vet claims of criminality? Well, we do. The only problem is there are no claims of criminality being made against the mob bosses and money launderers because they're in on the cabal that runs Russia. The people who aren't in on the cabal and the people who want to put an end to the cabal that that runs Russia are the ones that end up being charged with crimes, whether made up or otherwise. And you know, we have no we have no basis normally in the normal paperwork flow of things to evaluate whether or not the crime charge has been made up in Russia. And no interest in this administration in finding out either. Only a matter of doing favors for Putin or not. Right? Only after completing this process and determining which individuals are clearly the targets of legitimate criminal investigations do we then prioritize which of these criminals to pursue for either criminal investigation or deportation, Rady said. In other words, you know, uh, it, there's a lot of discretion built into the system and they're taking advantage of every bit of it. And who's going to argue? Well, what means have you or I got to figure out whether or not the crime is real? This uh, Natasha Bertrand has the ability at least to ask Sasha or whatever the person's name is, 
and get their side of the story. But then again, what would a criminal tell you? Yeah, it's all made up. I'm innocent. Latoya Turner, Interpol's Washington communications chief, declined to comment on this, by the way. But Michelle Estland, a criminal defense attorney who focuses on Interpol defense work, told me, that's some specialty, there is a disconnect between our decision to not have an extradition treaty with Russia and the decision to allow Russia to circumvent the extradition process using red notices. The effect is we are removing people to countries that we would not normally extradite to. And of course, it only goes in one direction. Uh, you could not have issued such a notice and have hope for a response if it was your interest in, let's say, having Edward Snowden return to, to us. Though perhaps that's a special situation. Sasha was initially detained on the basis of overstaying his visa, according to court records. DHS ultimately argued that he was not eligible for asylum, we hear this a lot, because he had been convicted of, quote, a particularly serious crime in Russia, one that Sasha and his lawyer had argued was politically motivated, as criminal charges in Russia so often are. Like, you know, Magnitsky. Despite an immigration judge's finding that Sasha testified credibly with regard to his fears of political persecution, the court denied his request for asylum and ordered him, quote, removed to Russia, unquote, in early June. He is still in detention, and his lawyer, Danielle Claffey, is fighting the decision. It was the worst asylum denial I have ever seen in the 10 years I've been doing this, Claffey told me, although I suspect that we could probably give her a few that would give it a run for the money. Louise Shelley, the founder and director of the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center at the George Mason University, who testified in the case as an expert witness, called the decision a travesty. For all the years that I have studied and worked with Russian experts within the law enforcement apparatus and the human rights community, Kalmykia was known as one of the locales with the most abusive of the legal systems. At least somebody knows Kalmykia. This is what Shelley wrote in her expert testimony for Sasha's case. It was particularly harsh on members of the Yabloko party that represented a political opposition and a voice of integrity in Russian politics. The liberal Yabloko party, of which Sasha is a member, has reported multiple cases of intimidation, threat, and physical use of physical force, fabrication of criminal cases against its members, and even outright murders of their activists. Hey, that's bad. Two other Russian nationals currently being detained in the U.S. on the basis of a red notice argue that DHS and the immigration courts have relied exclusively on Russian charges, which they contend are politically motivated, to keep them detained and deny them bond hearings. Alexei Karis, the head of the construction company ZAO, oh my goodness, it's a very long name, and let's not waste time trying to read it, but you can check it out in the article here. I'm sorry, I apologize. Based in the Russian port city of Vladivostok, fled from the U.S. to Russia in 2013 and applied for asylum after the Kremlin seized his private assets and bankrupted his company in a practice known as corporate raiding. Hey, we have a similarly named practice here. This has been the norm in Russia since the beginning of Putin's regi regime, although it says reign here, according to the Atlantic Council. Then in 2015, Russian authorities accused Karis and his business partner Igor Borbut of massive fraud and put out a red notice for their arrests. How do you get to be an oligarch slash mobster crime boss warlord in, in, in Russia or in America now at this point? How do you get to do that? You play ball with Putin. And if you don't, even if you think it's just a simple thing, well, you know, uh, he could get this from anybody. Let him find somebody else. We just want to be a small construction firm. He'll find somebody to do his bidding. And I'll lose to that person in competition. I'm willing to do that. I just want to live my simple life. No, can't be done. We'll take your company from you. We'll charge you with a crime. We'll not only just run you out of business, we may murder you. Oh, my God, I need to flee to America where this won't happen. Only guess what? Sorry, no puppet, no puppet. This will happen in America. Maybe not first to Americans and American political opponents. Maybe first to Trump's boss's political opponents. But 
slippery slope, yada, yada. You know how this goes. This is a very important story, and there's a tremendous amount more to it. We were never going to get through the entirety of the thing. Wanted to give you a flavor of it so that you could check in on it on your own. Had to Felt like I really had to put it on the record as another moving part in the whole Trump-Russia thing, even if it doesn't seem to affect the way we do our business here in this country. Another piece of the puzzle. Why would you do this for Russia? I'm not even certain there's a specific and obvious benefit to Donald Trump or anybody else in doing this other than it's just, look, I've been asked to do a favor by Putin and this case illustrates what happens to people who are asked to do favors for Putin and refuse. Now, he doesn't have the same power over us here as he does over those there. But then again, that's probably what people in England thought before they were poisoned in the last year or so. And boy, a lot more people keep turning up dead elsewhere. Uh, too many of them for me to consider this a comfortable situation. All right, I got to hand things off to Justice. He's going to round up all the other news stories we haven't had time to touch here. And let me see what we've got on tap here. Well, let's see here. When Kellyanne, what, what Kellyanne Conway calls more everyman interviews of Trump, others call a shoe shine. <laughs> <laughs> right. On the rest of the menu, Trump keeps bragging about how seven new steel plants, of those seven new things, there's just one problem here. Nobody can find even one of the seven, not six, not five, not four new steel plants, seven these days. There's more after this. From Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Yeah, here's this other thing. Trump also claims California is diverting water to the ocean instead of using it to fight fires, and nobody can figure out what the hell this conspiracy theory is about or where it came from. Trump also thinks his meddling to help Flynn stop illegal FBI counterintelligence investigations just like stopping the FBI from spying on Martin Luther King.